Hey, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, SPC 205, whatever time you're consuming this little piece of educational media. I am once again Vic McInnes, your public speaking instructor, coming to you live from my COVID-19 compound, uh, live on tape from my COVID-19 compound here in the heart of the Grovetown, Georgia metro area, the Aiken Tech Outpost here in lovely Columbia County, Georgia. Hey, today's lecture is brought to you by Japanese Baseball. Hey, if you're so desperate to watch baseball, you'll watch a bunch of guys you've never heard of, except for maybe that one guy you think played for the Orioles back in 2007, who are playing for teams you really don't care about. You should be in the mood to watch some Japanese baseball. Hey, today we're talking about audience analysis. Audience analysis. Now, you know, I've seen many speakers that could care less who the audience was. It happens all the time. Uh, my representative, who will remain nameless, but if you want to do a little research, you can find out who it is. Uh, he had his veteran speech. Didn't make any difference who the audience was. Didn't make any difference what the circumstances was. If he was uh, addressing a group of veterans, they got the same speech. So for this CSRA area, especially on this side of the river here in Georgia, most of our veterans are Vietnam veterans, and so it's a pretty good bet that that's the demographic you'll be talking to. But he was explicitly invited to a post-9-11 veterans forum. And so we got up there and talked for 15 minutes about how great Vietnam veterans were. Lost everybody. It was horrible. Okay? So it's important that you know your audience, and today we're going to be discussing uh, fairly quick. This should be a short little lecture. Uh, we're going to be discussing why the audience is important and how you find out about it. All right, let's go to the slides. As soon as this catches up, there we go. All right. So audience analysis is our job today. So this is uh, the man on the right here uh, is Thomas P. Tip O'Neill, great American. Uh, he was the uh, served in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1953 to 1987 as the uh, uh, congressman from Boston. He was the Speaker of the House from 1977 to 1987. Now, a lot of you guys have recognized the, 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 the guy on the uh, left as being President Ronald Reagan, who was a, a conservative Republican. Uh, uh, Speaker O'Neill, the guy on the right, was a, uh, a, a very progressive Democrat. But they managed to get along and work really well together, and I really like that photograph because as, as the lead Republican in the nation and the lead Democrat in the nation, they were able to work very well together and get uh, and compromise and work to build a lot of different things. So uh, Thomas P. Tip O'Neill is one of my favorite politicians in 20th century America. And, and one of Thomas uh, P. Tip O'Neill's great quotes was, In America, all politics are local. Now, that sounds sort of oxymoronic. It sounds like something that's so obvious it's, it's, it's kind of hard to, to understand. Uh, but what Speaker O'Neill is saying there, if you can't make a policy have impact or show policy to your voters that has impact in their day-to-day -day lives, on their block, in their neighborhood, you're not going to get anywhere. <coughs> So it is key, you know, uh, Speaker O'Neill knew, knew that it went in politics. We're also going to learn in public speaking, you become more effective if you are tuned to your audience. Uh, the beverage today is flavored water, in case you're wondering what I'm drinking there. Okay, so remember about the audience. They are why you're there. You don't get up and give a speech in an empty room. You get up and you give a speech in front of an audience for the purpose of either giving them additional information, entertaining them, or changing an attitude or belief through persua persuasion. <clears throat> you must tune your speech to every single audience. They will all be different. No two audiences are the same. No two speech classes I teach are the same. Either hour by hour when we're teaching in the classroom, when, you know, it always amazes me that I can have a class at 8 o'clock in the morning and they can be uh, exuberant, they can be uh, you know, excited, they can be chatty, they can be engaged, and then they leave, and then 25 and 10 minutes later, another class that doesn't engage, doesn't like to talk, doesn't really participate in the conversations. Every audience is different. Your job is to demonstrate relevance to them. Okay, let's say that I was going to talk to you today about global warming. 
Okay, and I was going to tell you that the island nation of Vanuatu was going to, in 15 years, was going to disappear because the rising ocean levels are just going to flood the country and make it disappear. Number one, I don't think that most Americans could point to Vanuatu on a map or even would be able to identify that Vanuatu is indeed an independent nation in the Pacific Ocean. I don't think that most Americans would care about anything that was going to happen 15 years from now. Okay, And then I don't think that people would believe that anything happening in Vanuatu would actually have any impact on them personally. When we talk about demonstrating relevance, we look for three specific things. First is time lineage. You have to make it relevant right now. It must be relevant to the particular audience you are in front of, not some sort of collective general you that may happen to come together in the future. It has to happen and be relevant to the people in the room. Okay? So for timeliness, if, well, I'll, I'll take all these together in just a second. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. That wasn't what I wanted. There we go. You have to demonstrate proximity. Remember Tip O'Neill's admonition. All politics are local. All issues have to have close proximity to your audience or they're not going to care. Now, it is possible that you can gain proximity through an audience by talking about the planet Earth. But in reality, that's not going to happen all that often. When we talk about proximity, we need to be talking about something, for, for, for the, to be specific, we need to be talking about something that's going to impact Aiken County, the CSRA, South Carolina, not the world as a whole. It has to happen locally. Then finally, you have to demonstrate personal impact. It has to be about me, okay? You know, it's like that old joke. So enough about enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think about me? It has to have personal impact. Okay, let's go back to the to the camera here real quick. Let me talk to you for a second face to face because we'll go off notes. Okay. I understand that most people don't care about Vanuatu. Okay, or the Marshall Islands. I, I understand that, or any of the other island nations that are scattered across the South Pacific. Okay, I get that. But what if I was to look at you and say, hey, listen. If we don't do something about global warming, it's going to take money out of your paycheck. When you go to the Kroger or you go to the Bilo, as global warming causes more and more agriculturally productive areas to become arid and not able to support agriculture, the food you buy is going to cost you money. And in the next five years, global warming is going to cost you an average of $600 more a year. I just made those figures up. Could be, it could be real, maybe not. But if I was able to prove to you that it was going to cost you, not somebody in, in the South Pacific, but cost you at the Bilo on Highway 1 an extra $600 a year, would that have impact? Yeah, it would, because it's about to happen. It's going to happen soon. It's going to be close, and it's going to, ha and it's going to happen to me. Okay. What if I told you because of the global warming... And the rising tides, we also, we've we seen it multiple times. I've been here uh, 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 five years, and in that time, I've seen Charleston flood three times. Okay, What if you were told that major flooding of Charleston is going to happen two to three times a year? And that's going to require the building of a massive seawall that's going to cost $7 billion. And that's going to have to be paid by the taxpayers of South Carolina, which is you and me. Okay, and it's gonna have to. You're gonna have to start paying that extra money in the next two years. Okay, now we've got proximity. Okay, we've got timeliness. We've got personal impact. All right, that would be a much more credible argument about global warming for the people of South Carolina than saying 50 years from now the polar bears will go extinct. I've never seen a polar bear in the wild. Okay, I, I, that doesn't mean I want them to go extinct. It just means it's very hard for me to cue in on that. In fact, I think one of the things, when I first started hearing about global warming way back in the 1970s, they were saying it was you know going to happen in 2032. I'm thinking in 2032, I'm going to be 78 years old. I'm 15 now. I could care less what's going to happen when I'm 78 years old. Well, guess what? I'm 58 now, and 78 is a lot closer. Okay, so that's proximate to me. Okay? All right. Go back to the slides. So remember, you must demonstrate timeliness, proximity, and personal impact. <clears throat> now, the other thing we need to know before we really get started 
is the audience's initial disposition. And that is where the audience is when you start. <clears throat> if you want to move the audience from point A to point B, and B being your desired state being it either information in an informative speech, you want to make sure they're informed when you get to point B. If you want to make sure they've been entertained when you get to point B, if you want to make sure they're persuaded when you get to point B, you need to know where point A is. Okay, because let's say you're giving an informative speech on the fish populations in the Clark Hill Reservoir. If somebody had come in two weeks ago and gave a speech on the fish populations in Clark Hill Reservoir, you would want to know about that. <coughs> so first thing you need to do in any type of speech when you're talking to an audience is find common ground. Now, if you can't demonstrate you understand where they are, how will you be able to show them where they need to be? Okay, so find some sort of unity in the audience, something you can all agree on, some place, some anchor point that you can all go to. Okay, by building commonality, <coughs> you give them, you give, you form unity with the audience. And here's how you do it: Number one, use first-person pronouns. Don't say you people need to understand these. You say we need to understand it. Don't say those guys. Say we, us. Use first-person plural pronouns. Okay? Ask rhetorical questions, but make sure no one is going to want to answer. Okay? I am not a fan of rhetorical questions in speeches as a whole unless you're doing this specific thing. And here's why. As soon as you ask a rhetorical question... <clears throat> hey, we all believe that there should, you know, the fish population should be healthy in the Clark Hill Reservoir. Some Yahoo in the back is going to try to answer the question for you, and you're going to lose control of the audience. Okay, so when I say use rhetorical questions, I do want to make sure that you don't give anyone a need to answer or a chance to answer. <clears throat> Excuse me, got a bad tickle in my throat today. Be ready to provide the answer as quickly, you know, just give a half a pause for the question to sink in and then move on with your speech immediately after. And then finally, draw on some common experiences. Hey, at Aiken Technical College, we've all got common, some common experiences. We've all, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it's hot, you know, South Carolina in the summer is not a, not a good place to be. Okay, for the weather, uh, we've all, you know, and one of the things that I always like to use as a common experience is nobody likes the University of Alabama football team. I think that's pretty much universal. So those are common experiences that we can all draw on, okay? But ultimately, your success is going to depend on your credibility, okay? Because remember, we've studied Aristotle, we've talked to Aristotle, and we're going to talk about Aristotle again in a half a second. Your credibility, if you don't come across to that specific audience on the day that you're giving that speech, you are not going to be able to achieve the purpose, either informative, entertaining, or persuasive, if you don't come across as credible. So you don't have to be the smartest in the room, damn it, but you better be the smartest man on your subject. That was something my boss told me one time. I walked into a room, and my boss at that time was a two-star general. I walked into a briefing, and I got caught off guard by a question, okay? And I was just flat-footed until another person in the room who wasn't with me chimed in with an answer that, I didn't, that, that my boss did not like. And my boss came back and said, you don't have to be the smartest man in the room, damn it, but you better be the smartest man on your subject. I had to be the most credible source on my topic in that room or I was not going to achieve what I wanted to achieve. And that is a lesson I've carried with me for 30 years. Okay? One of the ways you can do that is what I should have done then is to rehearse and think of whatever questions are going to be asked of me to make sure that I know the answers and have the answers quick at hand in case I get asked any questions. The other way to do it is to demonstrate your knowledge and expertise. Okay? Make sure you're able to give information quickly. And even if you haven't got it memorized, make sure it's on your note cards. <coughs> Establish trustworthiness. And the best way to do that is to be personable. Show the people that you can act likable. Okay? And again, you don't have to be personable. You just have to act personable. 
Okay, and then here, create ethos. Remember we talked about ethos, pathos, and logos, and Aristotle said that the most effective was ethos, because without ethos, your pathos and logos had no impact. Modern research have proved Aristotle right. <coughs> but remember, ethos wasn't you. It's not who you think you are. It's who the audience perceives you to be. It's based on your interactions with the audience. One of the worst instances I can ever remember seeing was that somebody asked, there was a guy giving a speech, and afterwards he had took Q&As. And he said at the beginning of the Q&As, he said, uh, just remember there are no stupid questions, only stupid people. And he got no questions because nobody wanted to talk to him because he'd been a bit of a jerk. Okay? So remember to create ethos. It's on the audience to give you ethos, not for you to, to build it on your own, on your own merit. Your sources of ethos are going to be your competence, your trustworthiness, your similarity to the audience, okay? And that goes back, and you know, we, you know, this week especially, we're like thinking, well, you know, that's that's gender, that's race, that's religion. Similarity is not any of, it is that, but it's also, can you find the common ground we were talking about earlier, okay? You can strive to create similarity with an audience. Then there's attraction. Yes, I hate to break it to everybody, <coughs> but if you're perceived as being attractive, you're going to be more persuasive. And that's just a fact of life. Is there anything we can do about that? No, probably not. I don't list that as encouraging you to try to make yourself more attractive. Uh, what I do is I do it as an opportunity to sort of tell you that it's something that you may find yourself saying, well, I don't know why I'm so, uh, I find this guy so credible. And it may be because, you, you know, uh, an attraction you have uh, 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 of some way. Football player, a professional athlete, somebody with a PhD that you, you find a, 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 tra a certain attraction to. Okay? And then sincerity. Again, you don't have to be sincere. You have to appear to be sincere. Okay? Let's go to the methodology, the nuts and bolts of how to do it, all right? We can't tailor our messages to each audience member, so we try to break the group down into a whole or into several parts, and here's how we do it. First of all is demographics. Demographics is anything you can statistically identify, age, gender, ethnicity, uh, uh, annual income, uh, religious uh, affiliation, um, you know, prior arrest records, uh, single parent homes, anything that you can break down into individual statistics. Uh, in, in Aiken County, 40% of children live in single family homes. Okay, that's a demographic. So when I stand up in front of an audience, I know there's a four in ten chance that the people in the in the audience, either if they're from Aiken County, either. Uh, came from a single family home, currently live in a single family home, or are the head of a single, uh, uh, single not single family, single parent home. So, um, <coughs> single parent families. That's what I've been att attempting to say here. Okay? Then there's purpose oriented analysis, which is what about my audience is important to the purpose of my speech? Okay? It takes in listener motivations, listener emotions, and, and the occasion. All right? And then the last method is going to be psychographic. What values, opinions, attitudes, or beliefs do my audience hold that's going to impact on the purpose of my speech? Okay? Some of them are fairly obvious. If you go to and you're going to be talking at a church, you can understand the values, opinions, attitudes, and beliefs that those church members are probably uh, have a good chance of holding. If you're talking to the Chamber of Commerce, those are all business people. If you're talking to the, the, the Aiken County Historic Society, those people all have certain uh, opinions, attitudes, and beliefs. Now, where are you going to find this information at? Let's run through some quick things. Mass media, newspapers, websites, TV stations from the area. The great thing about the 21st century is if you're coming from New York to talk to the uh, Aiken County Chamber of Commerce, you can find the newspapers, the TV stations, the radio stations, 
everything online and you can get them instantaneously as quick as the people here in Aiken County can get. Okay, so mass media. You can talk to the organization and find out what their background is. And a lot of that's listed on their websites. So that's pretty easy to find. You can uh, go to the U.S. Census Bureau. The U.S. Census Bureau has everything broken down by county. My previous com uh, 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 fact that 40% of the uh, households in Aiken County are single-parent families came from the U.S. Census Bureau. It took me about three minutes to find it. Okay, you just go to the uh, censusbureau.gov, or it may even be census.gov. In any event, go to the Google machine, type in U.S. Census Bureau. It'll take you right there. Type in Aiken County, South Carolina, and you can find out a ton of stuff. And every county in the United States is broken down the same way. There's first-person sources. Always call somebody up. All the time when I get invited to give a speech, I ask a ton of questions about, hey, tell me about your group. Tell me who's a member of your group. How old are they on average? What did they used to do for a living if they're retired? I seem to get invited to talk to a lot of retiree groups. Um, what do they used to do? What do they do now? Um, what are the education levels? What, 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 you know? Uh, and I will have at times even ask questions, you know, what's the, uh, <coughs> is it a church group? And if it's not a church group, do they, you know, do these people, what do they like? Do they attend church? Things like that. And then finally, um, public opinion polls. And again, be careful of public opinion polls because they are, and we're going to talk about public opinion polls later. You can use them, but just be careful, okay? Here's what you do with your data. Adjust your sources and supporting materials. If you're talking to a group of bankers about finance, you're going to need better materials to support your arguments than if you're talking to an accounting class at the University of South Carolina Aiken. Change your organization. You may find out that you can go through, if you're talking to people that you've already found out through your psychographic uh, research, is uh, uh, in agreement with you already, skip over the building agreement part of your speech and go straight to the what I need from you. Okay, And then be really close and watching for, for the uh, audience and giving you feedback because that's where your really uh, audience adaptation is going to take place. Okay, and the last thing I want you to remember, whoa, some graphics, graphics, audience analysis is an ongoing process. It never stops. Okay, let me do that again. Whoa. And that's awesome. I just found that button on uh, Keynote today on my, on my Mac, so I was pretty impressed with that. Okay, audience analysis never stops. All right. Anytime you give a speech in, in, in PSC two SBC two hundred five, you do not have to worry about this. I am going to give you plenty of feedback. Uh, you've already gotten feedback on your speeches. I will continue to do so. What I am going to tell you is, whenever I give a speech uh, before I leave that day, I ask a lot of the audience members, assuming they weren't throwing rotten fruit at me, and that has never happened. Um, is you know, I ask them, hey, listen, how do you think it went? Uh, what 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 do you think I could have done better? Okay, I will always ask those things, um, and the reason is I want to make sure I understand exactly what's going on and how well I did. And then a week later, or two weeks later, I will call the person invited who invited me back and say, "Hey, listen, how do you think I did? How was that? What's the feedback you've gotten from the people who were there? Because I want to know exactly how it went and what they thought." Okay. Um, so, and then I'm going to roll that into the information because I may address a group. I may give that a similar speech again. Remember, you never give the same speech to two different audiences. You always tailor. Okay. Uh, but I may address a similar group again sometime in the future. I may have, uh, you know, contact with that group again and they may, they may ask me back. But audience analysis is an ongoing process, and that's a very, very important thing to always remember. Otherwise, you become stiff and stale like my congressman who just trots out the same speech. And I've heard that guy give that speech four times, by the way, almost word for word. And it's not just if it was in a week, that would be one thing, but this was over two years. So, okay. All right, that's it for audience analysis. Um, we are actually on time... You guys, I hope you've seen this, the syllabus. I did them. We are actually on schedule. So there will probably be another uh, lecture this week on methods of presentation. It, it, that'll be an easy, easy one in organizing your uh, uh, speech, how to structure your speech. 
we're doing really well and keeping on time. So uh, keep up the good work. Everybody stay safe. Everybody stay well. And we will see you soon.